I'm Ann Browdy, the director of the Women's Studies in Religion program, and uh, I am delighted to welcome you to HDS and to our introductory panel for the Women's Studies scholars who are visiting us with us this year. The Women's Studies in Religion program um, is your program. It was started as a result of student interest and activism and insistence in the 1970s when women started coming to HDS for the first time in large numbers and noticed that there were no women on the faculty or on the syllabi. And so uh, they said to the faculty, rather loudly, um, that uh, they needed to do something about this. And the faculty said, well, we can't hire any women scholars. There aren't any that are qualified. There are, isn't anybody writing about this uh, in a way that makes them qualified to be on the Harvard faculty. And so the WSRP was designed to address that problem. And I think we have succeeded in, uh, we've had over 180 scholars who come through this program. If you, you have a sheet listing this year's scholars, if you turn that sheet over, you'll see the 180 scholars who have been in this program over the last 35 years. And I think you'll see the names of many people whose books you read in undergrad who changed the field, who created the field of women's studies in religion, in part because of their work in this program. And here you have the next five that we will add to that list that your students will be reading when you assign the books that they are writing this year um, when you're out teaching. Uh, in, your, in your fields. So it's really a thrill to um, be able to welcome them. This is their first time speaking at Harvard. Not all of them, some of them graduated from the school, blah, blah, blah. But, um, uh, but it's th their first time speaking uh, as part of this program. We're thrilled to welcome them. And um, because this, this is a program that was started by students, and we continue to have students participating in our search process to, uh, to select the scholars for the following year. So if you're interested in that, let uh, me and your representatives know. Um, and we have asked a student to moderate this panel. Um, Natalie Amador Solis is both a practitioner of engaged scholarship and a student of engaged scholarship. And um, she's going to be introducing and um, asking questions of our scholars. Natalie. So hello, everyone. Welcome to Harvard Divinity School. And I have the pleasure of introducing the Women's Studies and Religion Program uh, Research Associates for this year. So first, I'll go off giving an introduction, and then we'll go into a question and answer kind of section. So the first research associate is Alicia Israhuddin from the University of Malaya. And her research project is Misery Loves Company, Radical Failure as a Basis for Transnational Muslim Feminist Solidarity. And she will be teaching a course this spring on intimacy and emotion in the lives of Muslim women. The second research associate is Monica El Mercado from Colgate University. And her research project is a young Catholic girlhood and the making of American Catholicism, 1836 to 1911. And she'll be teaching a course this fall on women and gender in US Catholicism. Our third research associate, Monica Maltry from Georgia State University. And her research project is Hidden Histories, Faith as a Site of Black Lesbian Activism. And she'll be teaching a course this fall on leadership and womanist moral traditions. Fourth, we have Jayota Puri, who is from Simmons University. And her research project is on migrant rights, death, gender, and religion in South Asian diaspora. And she'll be teaching a course this fall on cultural politics of death rights. And then fifth, we have Carrie M. Sonia from Washington and Lee University. And her research project is Like a Woman in Labor, the Ritual and Social Dimensions of Childbirth in the Hebrew Bible and Ancient Israel. And her course would be this spring called Mothers, Diviners, and Prophets the Religious Lives of Women in the Hebrew Bible and Ancient Israel. So can we have a round of applause for all the research associates? <laughs> Thank you. So I will begin the question and answer panel section now. So this title of the panel is called Ethical Scholarship. 
So keeping with keeping this theme in mind, what are the ethical concerns that bring you to your scholarship? What ethical questions does your scholarship shed light on? And we'll start off with Alicia Israfuddin. So your work seems to balance the many studies of why Muslim women bail by interviewing women who made the decision to reject hijab and to unveil as adults. Why do you think this shift is important? What were the biggest surprises in the interviews you conducted? And why is Malaysia, the site of your work, an important site for the study of Islam? So do I come yes. up there? Okay. Thank you so much, Natalie, for the really kind introduction. Um, good morning, everyone. It's a, really, uh, it's a great pleasure to be up here to speak with you for the very first time. So to respond to uh, Natalie's questions, um, very good questions. So why is, it, why is this shift particularly important? So one of the things I'm, I'm interested in at the moment are these kind of trends that are counter to what is often understood as Islamic resurgence or Islamic revivalism happening in Muslim majority countries. So trends that are counter would be women who decide that they don't want to veil anymore. They don't want to wear the hijab anymore. So it's very important because what it tells you, it tells you another side to the story of Islamic resurgence. It tells you the story that um, Islamic resurgence isn't exactly a totalizing process. It doesn't touch every aspect of people's lives. And there's a lot of focus in um, the anthropology and sociology of Islam in a lot of countries where when Islamic resurgence happens, it sort of transforms every aspect of Muslim people's lives. So what I'm interested in are sort of the incomplete processes that happen in um, everyday people and in everyday uh, lives of Muslims. It tells you that people are different. There are different priorities that people have that are not necessarily religious, but there are other things that may be non-religious, perhaps secular, that are influencing their lives. So um, one of the major surprises that I had um, while I was conducting this research was that um, how the field came to me. So, so I conducted a lot of interviews and I talked to a lot of women who've experienced this um, disaffection with um, commodified versions of um, Islamic fashion. Um, and they, they wanted to talk to me as a researcher about their experiences of disaffection, they will, be, they will feel very uncomfortable talking with people who are closest to them. They can't talk to their friends. They can't talk to their loved ones. They definitely cannot talk to their families about this. However, they were very happy to talk to a, a third party who was seen as academic, um, objective, maybe neutral, somebody who they've never met in their lives to talk about something quite personal about their, um, their, their relationship with the hijab um, and how they don't want to wear it anymore. And I remember uh, spending months in which I would receive phone calls from women I've never met. They would call me, they would write to me. And then what was really interesting was that it wasn't just about veiling that they wanted to talk about or the fact that they didn't want to veil anymore, but it connected to other things that were happening in their lives. They started to talk to me about their marital breakdown, how they were having problems in their family, how their business was, was failing. And it just sort of like, um, veiling is just kind of a secondary aspect of it, but it opened like a gateway to talking about their life problems. So um, going to your third question, why is Malaysia an important place to study Islam? Um, Malaysia has a, um, a modest majority of Muslims, and it is a multicultural society. And it is almost, you could say, um, a, an experiment of how different ethnic, cultural, linguistic, and religious groups live together in relative harmony. Um, and Malaysia is seen as an object of multiple processes in the, last, um, in the last 50 years. It was the object of modernization, Islamic revivalism, globalization. And what was really interesting to see were how gendered boundaries were redrawn because of these processes and how these processes interacted with one another. 
And the lives of Muslim women are particularly interesting in all of this because when we talk about industrialization and modernization, it meant that you see a lot more women in the public sphere working, earning a salary, and, um, and this was happening very, very rapidly since the 1980s. So what we're seeing right now in the 21st century are women who are very successful, but they're kind of balancing you know, expectation of what it means to be a modern Muslim woman in the 21st century. So Malaysia is an interesting place to examine all of that. Thank you. <laughs> so for Monica Mercado, your work focuses on young girls in 19th century American Catholicism. This requires you to break away from histories in which women and girls appear as victims in anti-Catholic literature. How does the history of Catholicism change when you make this reorientation? How did you reconstruct the perspectives of 19th century Catholic girls? And lastly, how do children differ from adults as agents of religious history? Great, thank you, Natalie. Um, these are all <laughs> great questions, some of which I'm still trying uh, to work through this year uh, as I write. Um, but I started working um, on lay women in 19th century America because every time I entered 19th century Catholic women into my library catalog in graduate school, I got all the anti-Catholic, anti-convent literature, um, some of which that we will read in my course this fall. Um, because, but I became a little bit frustrated wondering what Catholics actually themselves thought about women and gender in the 19th century and not what Protestants and anti-Catholics were saying about Catholic women. Um, and when I did that, and when I made that pivot, I realized a couple of things. I realized that there are lots of rich histories of 19th century uh, religious women and sisters, um, histories of religious orders, and that there were lots of rich histories of 20th century lay women doing political things um, and socially organized. Um, and I wanted to figure out what women who didn't choose to go into the convent were doing in 19th century America. Um, and what I found um, were young women and girls before there were Catholic colleges um, going to the convent school. I found many Catholics who cared a lot about what was happening to this women. Um, and when I sort of started to look at their writings and guidebooks, I realized that this was showing me, and by this I mean studying young people and young women in particular, um, the church's anxieties about class mobility, about whiteness, um, and making a white and uh, middle and upper middle class Catholic church in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, so I kept getting younger. <laughs> I was looking at lay women, and then I started looking at women right before going to college, um, and now I'm looking at young women and girls. Um, and that brought me to the history of childhood and religion. Um, and I think in 2019, scholars of American Catholicism and really all um, religious studies scholars often have an ethical and historical imperative to think about children in religious traditions. Obviously, in the tradition I study, um, which has been so um, sort of critically um, focused on dealing with the Catholic sex abuse scandal, um, I think that trying to understand children's place in religious traditions um, is, is an imperative. Um, and so my conversation partners have grown. Um, I'm looking at some of the other questions Natalie asked me. How do I reconstruct the perspectives? Um, so much good work on religion and childhood deals with the 20th and early 21st century, right? So ethnographers can actually talk to children and young people. Um, I'm in the usual places, convent archives, Catholic archives, but I'm looking at things that the archivists consistently tell me nobody's been looking at, um, at the archives of convent academies, right, of the schools that sister builders were running. Um, and I'm finding both the work that kids were doing in those schools, but also the creative output of teacher sisters, right, who were writing and directing plays and coming up with games for children to do. So I'm learning something about religious sisters in the process. Um, I'm conscious of the time, but I'll just say, um, how do children differ as agents of religious history? It's a huge uh, question that lots of people like to debate. But I would say for me that moving towards 
um, children and youth, um, has given me some ability to think about play in religion, um, playing with identity, um, but also literally in print and visual and material sources, right? What are the sorts of things that are conveying religious tradition and ideas um, to children? Everyone wants to tell me what they did in Sunday school as a result of this project, um, or have something to say, right, about Catholic school uniforms, um, <laughs> right? But these are all sort of like cultural pieces um, that children have to try to make sense of their worlds. Um, so I'm trying to get at that through the archives, but I think that there is a sense of play and then interplay, right? How are children interacting um, with other adults within their tradition, right? Their parents at home, but also religious authorities. So I'm interested in these questions um, that lead us into gender and race and class and age, um, and I guess, uh, for some of you in this room, maybe we'll talk about this more <laughs> starting next Friday uh, in my class. So thanks, Natalie. So for Monique Mountry, your project on faith as a site of black lesbian activism questions the common view of black religion as antagonistic to LGBT rights. You argue instead that more black LGBT persons claim a religious identity than in any other racial group, and that black lesbian religious leaders are particularly prominent in social justice activism. Can you tell us about one or two of the individuals who led you to these conclusions? How does their personal identity and experience relate to their activism? Additionally, has learning about them changed your view of black religion? Thank you. Thank you for the questions, um, and thank you all for your captive attention. So I invoke uh, my womanist ancestor, Katie Cannon. Uh, in this moment, she stated that the anecdotes that we have, the anecdotal evidence, reveal truth about oppressed people's lived reality and how they live with integrity. And so part of what my project wants to do is to look at these stories of everyday women who are just going about their um, work and doing good for their communities and uplift them as um, anchors for understanding how oppressed people can resist, uh, and particularly uh, people of color who are within religious traditions that largely have uh, restrained their activism. So um, to, to answer the first question, I think part of what my project wants to do and what I'm gonna do in the class is to think about what it means to be a person of faith within uh, a religious tradition that has largely been touted as antagonistic to one's faith. So how do you juxtapose being the thing that you're told you can't be, but that is your identity? Uh, next, what I have tried to do in both the interviews that I've done, at this point I've interviewed 22 people uh, for the project, and um, I'll talk about two quickly. Uh, the first um, is kind of how I got into the project in the, be in the beginning. Uh, Bishop Yvette Flunder, uh, who spoke here, and, and she's a prolific uh, author, speaker, uh, and leader, uh, she started out doing social justice activism, and it sort of just kept reoccurring for her. Um, and the thing she's most known for is HIV AIDS activism. Uh, her church, City of Refuge, uh, has uh, many, many uh, irons in the fire there in dealing with direct services for persons who are living with HIV and AIDS, uh, both providing housing, uh, community organizing, um, and healthcare access. And she does so from a faith perspective because she believes that her tradition calls her uh, to advocate for the least of these. And so that's one of the ways she does that. One of the other persons that I uh, will talk about in the course, uh, we're reading Pamela Lightsey's uh, Our Lives Matter, uh, a text on woman is queer theology. And part of what she looks at is the Black Lives Matter movement and its uh, connection to queer theology and how it is a representation of queer 
agitation and activism in the world to deal with a, a real life crisis. And she does that as a United Methodist uh, minister. And so she's also advocating in the United Methodist Church for the full access of uh, women and gays uh, in that tradition. So we're gonna uplift and we're gonna highlight those. And part of what these stories I hope share are that women are not one-sided, single issue activists. I'm not saying that men are overwhelmingly, but what I've seen um, is that men build institutions, black gay uh, religious leaders build institutions, their bishops, their leaders uh, that um, procreate other versions of themselves and women uh, share leadership and are uh, in my uh, exploration are much more interested in having their tentacles in many different pots because they can't have and I'm gonna call it a luxury of addressing just one thing. They can't just address patriarchy. They have to also look at homophobia. They also have to look at classism. They also have to look at sexism. Uh, and so there are many different uh, avenues in which they do their work. And so uh, that's one of the things that the project revealed for me. I won't say it revealed it about black religion as much as it revealed to me how black religion has many expansive viewpoints and that we should always be looking for a kaleidoscope approach to understanding uh, that faith tradition. Thanks. So for Gay YouTube Curry, at a moment when anti-immigrant rhetoric abounds, you have chosen to look at the lives and more precisely the deaths of South Asian immigrants in the United States to glean lessons about being and belonging. Why did you choose the right surrounding death as the opening through which to enter the religious lives of the South Asian communities in the United States? How does gender figure into your story? And lastly, in a world in which one in eight people is a migrant, how do scholars of religion need to account for this fact in their work? Natalie, thank you so much and I'm just gonna turn this on so I keep track of time a little bit. Um, how's everyone doing? <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I'm very, very happy to be here. Um, it's such a luxury to have a whole year to think through a new project, and uh, what a gift. And to also be in conversation with these amazing projects, it's um, you know more than one could hope for. To come to these really good questions, um, this project for me um, started many years ago when I was actually working on something entirely different. I'm trained as, a, I really have been a sexuality and gender studies scholar who does work on states and nations and all of that. But many years ago, I saw this photograph, uh, actually, yeah, one photograph of this cremation of a sick migrant that happened in 1907. And it was something that just sort of left a visceral um, imprint on me. And it was my first moment in terms of really confronting um, the question that death is not only about time, the cessation of time, if you will, but death is also about relationship to place. And in a sense, when you think about it, the sort of the broader narrative is that we're supposed to die in our, you know, at a reasonable after having lived a good life in our old age and in a place that we call home, right? That's sort of, that's the broader narrative. But when you look at that narrative from the angle of migrants, it changes, right? So as migrants, we're supposed to not only die at an appropriate time, but we're supposed to die or we think we're gonna go home to die, right? We're gonna go back to some place that we came from rather than our place of arrival and that we, or that we are going to die in a place of arrival once it has become home, once it belongs to us and we belong to it. And so when you look at sort of, when you come at it in terms of the deaths of migrants and our news feeds are sort of just filled every day, there is, you know, it's just, it's an endless catalog of people uh, who are migrating, crossing borders, who are losing their lives either through that process of migration or, at a, or you know, before they've had a chance to settle in or claim a life to wherever they are, um, uh, to wherever they are migrating. 
So when you start to look at it from that angle, it really brings up both questions of time and place, but also that question to land, right? Like, does it change? Does it matter that you lost your life in a different place while you were crossing a border? Does that change your relationship to that place, to that territory, to that nation? So there are all of these questions that really emerge as a result of it. And the question of religion becomes central um, to all of this, because ultimately when we think about it, the rights, death rights, are really about the living, right? That's what sort of, it's for the living that these rights and rituals really matter. And so when people lose others, you know, their neighbors, their, um, um, their fellow travelers, they lose them in places that are in many ways foreign. Um, how do these rituals get adapted? How do they get modified in order to still feel that sense of completeness or mourning or closure? And um, what happens, you know, particularly when these rituals and rites are being performed under the pressure of state laws that are not in sync or in terms of dominant cultural norms um, that, again, are not in sync, particularly in terms of South Asian religions, uh, which for the most part tend to be, you know, the people that I'm looking at and are Sikh. I, I have another sort of piece in terms of Muslims. Um, there are some Christians, but they're predominantly Sikh, Muslim, and Hindu. Um, so what happens when these rites are um, not in sync? And temples and places of worship become very central in sort of navigating that relationship between life and death, um, between life and the afterlife. Um, to the uh, one more thing that I will say about, um, you know, particularly Natalie, you sort of emphasized the question of the ethics. And one of the um, ethical impulses of this project is to put these stories, both the past as well as the present, in relationship to the histories of other marginalized communities. So whether it is Native Americans and the ways in which cremation for some communities, some nations, the ways in which that um, they were sort of, um, um, I'm still looking into sort of exactly what happened, but the ways in which they gave way to other practices or were forced to give way to other practices. Um, or in terms of the segregation um, of black cemeteries and, um, or you know, sort of grave sites within those. So sort of looking at some of these histories um, to put South Asian um, stories and narratives in relationship to other communities. To the question of how gender figures into this story, um, in two ways. One is that the history of early migration in terms of South Asians is predominantly about men and masculinity. And so these are people who travel together, sometimes in conjunction with their relatives, somebody within the household, other times within the village, um, people from the sort of the general area, and the ways in which they forged community in relationship to each other and how death was one of those sort of pivotal places in which, which really brought them together. Um, so it, it, that's one of the ways in which gender figures. And then um, much, even though particularly the early period, it was almost entirely men women were here and there, were part of that migration. And part of the challenge is to really trace back some of what has been, um, you know, sort of forgotten or never really fully documented. Um, and again, it raises the question of the archive. And as I was alluding to earlier, as somebody who's really, um, my work has really been about sexuality and gender, um, you know, my sense is that there is much more here um, that, Part of it is as I, you know, work through the project and think more about it and um, come to grips with it, you know, I think it's going to have a much um, fuller story. I just don't know what that is yet, um, which is okay. I think that's sort of the exciting part about, you know, when projects bring you to them and then you're forced to, you know, or the pleasure or the excitement of having to come to grips with it. It's a project on death and, um, I am a cheerful person. It's not the most cheerful thing. <laughs> but there is excitement. Um, what can I say? You know.
Um, one in eight mig uh, people is a migrant, and so scholars of religion, um, you know, it reminded me of uh, something that Amitabha Kumar has said, that the migrant is the prophet of our times, yes? And the lives of migrants in so many ways are um, indicative or they are revealing about how inadequate and how limited national borders and nationalisms and states, how they are so inadequate to containing the complexity of our lives, right? And so um, I think for, um, you know, much as scholars of religion really look at migrant ritual practices and religious practices, and there's a lot of that literature, I think what needs to happen more, and I'm hoping to enter into some of these conversations, I think we need to look at the connections between religion and uh, geopolitics through the lives of migrants. So that would be, um, well, thank you. And um, I look forward to seeing you out and about or in classes or wherever, but I hope there'll be a chance to talk some more. Thank you. Thank you, and for Carrie Sonia. Your research project looks at childbirth in the Hebrew Bible and in ancient Israel. The Hebrew Bible is a fixed text focused on patrilineal ge genealogy. How do you reconstruct religious practices that fall outside the interests of biblical authors? Childbirth, for example. Your work challenges the dichotomy in which women's practices are considered to be magic and men's practices are considered to be religion. What gave rise to this supposed dichotomy? What happens when you call it into question? Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Natalie, for these questions. Also, I have to say, it's so exciting to hear in more depth the projects of my colleagues. I'm getting so excited about the conversations uh, that we're gonna have in the coming year, and I hope you guys are getting excited, too, about what kinds of classes you can take. So these are really big questions that Natalie poses, so I'm gonna do my best to try to unpack, right, my, my responses to them uh, and keep it within the time frame that we've been allotted. So how do you reconstruct religious practices that fall outside the interests of biblical authors? Okay, so this is a big one. Um, so I came to this project because, first of all, there's been a growing sort of development, uh, not only in biblical studies, but also in religious studies, of attention to internal religious plurality. Right, so you guys are gonna be talking about this as you go through HDS. You're gonna be talking about not Judaism, but Judaisms, right? Not Christianity, but Christianities. So not thinking about religious traditions as monoliths, but really paying attention to that internal diversity. And so similarly, uh, in the study of the Hebrew Bible and Israelite religion, there's been an attention to not just the temple-focused religion that we see biblical writers talking about in the Hebrew Bible, but there's also been attention by scholars to family religion, to household religion. And when we think about you know, how ancient people are religious, right, and how much time they spent at a temple versus you know, in the home, it makes sense that the, the majority of their religious lives would have taken place in the context of the domicile, in the context of their families. Right, so scholars have been trying to reconstruct those kinds of practices. Um, so I came to this project about childbirth because my first project was about death, which <laughs> is fascinating, it's so much fun. And so, uh, so with this project, I really got the whole spectrum, right? The whole life cycle. But it does pose some challenges, right? Because the Hebrew Bible is our primary, uh, most detailed piece of evidence for reconstructing uh, ancient Israel, and it is, patrilineal in focus, right? And it's relatively narrow in its interests about the temple, about covenant, and it doesn't have that much to say explicitly about family religion. So I've, I've thought about you know, some of the strategies that we use as scholars in trying to reconstruct right, these uh, less prominent aspects, less prominent to us based on the evidence that has come down to the present day, but for ancient people would have been the predominant way in which they engaged uh, with the divine, right? So here are just some, you know, three sort of tools in our toolkit for doing that. 
Uh, one is paying attention to what biblical writers take for granted, right? So what they assume the reader might know, sort of practices that you know you don't really have to go into detail about because everybody would have known them. Like, how have you guys ever read a document telling you like how to uh, celebrate a birthday? right, or giving you the lyrics of the happy birthday song, right? It's like that sort of thing, these sort of rituals that are taken for granted by some of these writers because they are so common, they are so pervasive. So we have to kind of read against the grain when we're using the biblical text to reconstruct some of these rituals, thinking about what they're taking for granted. All right. Uh, another uh, method that we can use is thinking about the residues of practices in the material record. Right? And Harvard is a really exciting place to do this kind of work because we have just next door to the Divinity School the Harvard Semitic Museum, which is just a, a wealth of material, of you know, archaeological evidence from ancient Israel, including, and some of you may have already seen it if you've gone into the building, a life-size reconstruction of a typical Israelite house. All right, a four-room house that you can actually see inside for us to really think about the materiality of religious practice, including in the house itself, right? Thinking about what kinds of ritual objects would have been involved in these practices, including childbirth. You know, we're looking at a reconstruction of a space where childbirth likely would have taken place. And how does that affect, right, the ways that we think about the rituals surrounding it? And then the third tool in our toolkit is thinking about comparative evidence. So looking outside of ancient Israel, putting it in comparison with you know, other cult ancient cultures from Syria or Mesopotamia, and thinking about these kinds of religious practices, religious, religious practices of the family and of the household that really transcend national boundaries in the ancient world, despite what the biblical writers might have us think, right? Um, so moving on to some of the other questions. This is such a great question. What gave rise to the supposed dichotomy between magic and religion? This is a big one. So I'm going to take two steps at this. All right. One way of, of uh, approaching an answer to that question is thinking about the language of the Bible itself and the ways in which the Bible, the language of the Bible is gendered. So for instance, in groups of mixed gender, Right? The default is that that group becomes male, grammatically. So then it becomes difficult when we're reading through the Hebrew Bible to recognize the participation of women in groups of mixed gender, right? including in religious practice. Similarly, we can look at the, you know, the theology of some books in the, in the Hebrew Bible and in descriptions of covenant and when the Israelites break covenant with the God of Israel, whose proper name is Yahweh, right? the sort of terminology that gets used, one of the very common verbs that's used is Hebrew zana, which literally means to whore after. It's sometimes translated a bit more softly uh, in English translations as to play the harlot. But it literally means to commit adultery. So casting Israel right in the role of wife, an adulterous wife, right, to its husband, Yahweh, the God of Israel. So, Partly we have you know, this gendered language of our ancient document itself that we have to contend with, but we also are inheriting a lot of terminology from a very old discipline, right? And so we have to be very critical of the terms that we've inherited, like magic and religion, and thinking about what those terms do to our evidence. So especially a term like religion, and thinking about how that term has been de deployed in different historical periods and cultural contexts, to render certain people and practices marginalized, all right? And then what actually is this term magic? It's often a polemical term, right? It's a term of you know, somebody else describing another group's practices, right, and trying to delegitimize them. So by thinking about women's practices, religious practices in ancient Israel as magic instead of religion, and we're really reproducing that kind of polemic, right? We're reproducing that rhetoric that renders those practices marginalized, okay? And so 
we also need to think about, as I said, the, the bulk of Israelites' religious lives taking place in the context of the home and among the family, and not necessarily the temple. But here we have the Bible as our mo most detailed piece of evidence in reconstructing ancient Israel. And so by emphasizing these important ritual events like childbirth, right, a central event in the life cycle of the family, we're really you know, reorienting our conception of Israelite religion in general. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, so now we have about 10 minutes to open up to questions from the audience and also if the research associates would like to ask questions of each other. So any takers, yes? <laughs> thank you all so much. It's so great to hear about all your research, and I think the students here will really benefit from your courses. Um, my question is for Dr. Mercado about your use of visual and material evidence for your research. Um, so I'm curious if you could speak a little bit more about um, the sorts of sources you're going to be looking at. And I'm also curious if you could talk about, I realize the use of different evidence is a historiographical question, but I'm also curious if you could talk about what it means as an ethical dimension of your work to center uh, unconventional non-textual um, sources in your research. All right, this is the best microphone, so we're gonna keep popping up and down. Um, that's a great question for a historian, how, um, and sometimes a hard one. Historians are sometimes afraid of visual and material things. I came to being a historian from a museum background, so I wanted to work with stuff. Um, and what I have been finding, particularly in the convents I've been visiting of late, um, is that the girls that I'm studying were asked to produce so much writing, um, and the ways in which that writing was bound and saved, um, and the drawings they made, um, to me, are both print and visual and material sources, and the way that they were sort of passed down, um, the ways in which print culture um, actually is really critical to this. A lot of the, um, the world of my children is actually in the mail. Um, Protestants don't have, <laughs> um, you know, are, are not the only ones using uh, subscription culture in 19th century America, so lucky for me, um, the Catholic publishing world is booming in this moment, um, taking the form of the American Tract Society, in fact, as their goal. And so the kinds of um, toys and things that children are playing with, sometimes I can get my hands on them, sometimes I just have the advertisements or the descriptions of them, um, but I'm looking at a lot of print in new ways, um, looking at illustrations um, that were helping children imagine um, both religious worlds and the world around them, and then the ways that a lot of that print was saved. I don't have a lot of clothes or toys. Um, some of the things that my colleagues in the 20th century have, eBay is a great place for 20th and 21st century Catholic historians. Um, but I'm trying to do a lot with print, and I hope that's something for the students in my course um, as we think about the things actually even that exist at Harvard. We'll be using the Schlesinger um, Library for w Women in America um, to think about how even interesting print sources, how we can mine those um, for the visual and think through the material even if we don't have that. So that's just a very tiny slice to answer your great question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience? Yes? Uh, thank you, first of all, for, um, for all your uh, discussions. It was very enjoyable. Uh, my question is for Ms. Izharuddin. Uh, concerning your your research about you know why the Muslim woman you know wanted to take off their veil and what caused them to do it, so did you focus in your research more on people in you know a specific place in a specific culture, and also relating to that, did you find that women who wore it because of because it was culturally necessary of them were more prone to taking it off than women who found the veil and decided to wear it on their own rather than being forced to wear it um, were less prone to taking it off. Um, yeah, uh, great question. So um, it's, it's a question that I'm asked quite a lot 
you know, like what kind of backgrounds um, are the women I've interviewed um, and I've used as my research participants. So um, I conducted a research over the course of two years and I opened it up in such a way that I'm talking to women of various kinds of backgrounds, different ages, who would have experienced different stages of modernization, industrialization, and also Islamic resurgence at different phases as well. So um, one of the trends um, of Islamic resurgence in the 1980s was that when you go to school, you have to wear the hijab, and it's part of the school uniform, and it's uh, compulsory, and it was something that um, you, it's, it's a form of discipline that you have internalized this and that's what you're expected to wear outside of school. And by the time you become adults, it's, it's kind of like difficult to take it off because you've internalized um, how you're supposed to dress and it's very closely connected to your religious identity. And um, there is this expectation that you have to be very pious as well. So, um, and the, the women that I've interviewed come from sort of mostly rural, um, urban backgrounds, some of them rural, and because of the changes of um, the socioeconomic background of the entire country itself, it meant that a lot of women came from mostly agricultural backgrounds in the 1980s and moved to the city. So, um, and these are women who are in their 50s, and these are women who are also quite young. Um, that's, um, and I think one of the other things that was also really interesting was that um, the impact of globalization was also one of the influence behind why they wanted to take the hijab off. So there was a convergence between the things was, that was happening abroad. So some of them decided that their, their understanding of Islam had completely changed after 9-11, somewhere that happened very, very far away, but it sort of left this impact on, and their understanding of what Islam is. And more recently, some of them were influenced by what was happening in Syria with the rise of um, ISIS as well. And that also converged with things that were happening personally in their own lives. You know, they were having um, sort of a kind of spiritual crisis and um, things that were happening internationally sort of was also influencing their own personal decisions of how they would practice Islam. Um, and some of them they would find, this is a more minority uh, and it's a little bit more sensitive that there were some of these women who decided to also renounce Islam as well, but kind of secretly as well. So, um, and these are things that are not openly discussed in Southeast Asia, mainly because um, there is this rise regionally um, in Southeast Asia of Islamic conservatism, and in which Islam has become more bureaucratized, a little bit more politicized and in many ways quite commodified and make people feel like a little bit disaffected because of how commodified Islam has become in the public sphere. So this is more like the, the climate that people are in and how these trends are influencing um, their, their, their personal piety. Um, so I'm trying to answer your questions as best as I can, but we could talk about it a little bit more afterwards. Thank you. Thank you for that great question. So we have time for one more question. So if anyone has a question, or if the research associates want to ask a question to each other. No? If not, yes? No questions. So I would ask one final question. What ethical questions does your scholarship shed light on? If you could share maybe one question related to the the relationship of ethics and your work to close out the panel. So whoever would like to start. Yes. I feel on the spot, I'm an ethicist by training. <laughs> so I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I think the first question that my project, um, that's at the forefront of my project, is what does ethical moral leadership look like in a variety of forms? And so I want to investigate leadership that isn't just sole one model focus, one leader, but I want to look at shared leadership models, um, cooperative leadership models, and think about what that means for social justice activism today. Thank you. 
Um, I mean, I feel like I began to answer this question in some ways. 19th century historians are never asked these questions uh, in such a way. Um, so, I, But I do think as I've moved uh, earlier in the life cycle, right, there are a lot of ethical considerations about studying and speaking for children, right? I have to be honest about the fact that in the 19th century, the records that I'm presented with um, means that I have to make um, some assumptions um, and claims um, and speak for children in the way that many of my um, subjects, the adult subjects in my book, are speaking for children constantly. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of adults in the history of childhood, um, and I'm conscious of thinking, um, and which is why I don't stay just in the 19th century, um, and I'm happy to be in a group of people who range from uh, ancient Israel to the 2019, 2020, and beyond, um, to think through some of these questions beyond um, my sort of uh, historical time period. Thank you. I would just say, if we have time, is this loud enough? Um, I think also ethical scholarship, just as I've been reflecting on it in my own work, it really has to do with amplifying those marginalized voices, right? And what sort of scholarly methods or techniques do we have to, <coughs> excuse me, um, pursue and in some cases invent in order to do that with whatever data set we're given in whatever discipline? So that's that's been one way in which I've been exploring that in my own work. Thank, thank you. Um, in my own work, I, I think about like how as a feminist researcher, we talk with women who are engaging with very difficult personal life issues. And the researcher, in my case, it become, she becomes like a, a counselor um, in which research participants turn to. And because mm -hmm. of that, we're not trained as counselors to talk with mm -hmm. women who are going through difficult times. And that becomes a huge ethical issue for me, you know, and and they, they turn to you because they think you're highly educated and therefore you're not judgmental. Um, <laughs> and, and, they're, and they're, you know, you, they think you're open to like, like weird stuff. So, <laughs> and, and, but it's true because that's how, that's my experience. Like these women, they, they can't turn to anybody else. They can't turn to the people closest to them. Mm -hmm. However, the researcher is the person they turn to, a person they've never met. They pick up the phone and they call a researcher who they think will be open to listening to them. So that for me is like the biggest sort of ethical methodological issue that I've been think grappling with for the last few years. Um, I think I was um, alluding to this a little bit in my comments. Um, I've been thinking about it more in terms of what are the sort of what's the political project um, that is really driving um, this work, and I appreciate the sort of the lens of the ethic um, uh, or of the or of the ethical. And for me, it really is that relationship between um, migrants and belonging, in a way that has to be inflected through questions of land and colonialism and slavery and ongoing migration and migration from other parts of the world, including other parts of Asia or Central America as we continue to see. So it really is, um, it, it's that question about um, belonging, which I think is really um, belonging place, which is really at the heart of all of this. Thank you. So can we give another round of applause to all the research associates? So be on the lookout for all of the courses and events that will be available throughout the school year with the research associates. And have a great rest of your orientation. Thank you. Mm -hmm.